just afraid. I didn't know what to do and I was afraid to do anything. Uh, and so it was a slow climb out of it. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Millionaire Series. I'm excited. My name is Joe Moffitt, and I am here with our guest speaker, Jordan Berry. He has a fantastic story, and he talks about business and laundry mats and real estate. And we're going to jump into all the numbers, all the good stuff. But first, I just want to say, Jordan, thanks for being on the show, and welcome. Hey, you know what? It's an honor to be here. I am. I, I just genuinely, I feel very honored. And you probably don't even know this, actually. My first experience with you uh, was through uh, some group coaching that I was doing. And so I was in one of those, uh, you know, coaching classes that you were doing. And uh, so super big honor to be on the podcast with you, talking to you face to face on Zoom. I appreciate that. I didn't know that. So that's really good to know, actually. Yeah. Um, so welcome. I want to be able to share with everyone your story because our channel here at Master Life by Design is all about consciously creating the life you want, life by design, but through financial freedom. We want to help people create financial freedom through passive income and mindset. And so we're going to dig into that. But first, why don't you, I'll pass the mic to you. Why don't you share with the audience a little bit about your story, where you came from, how you got to where you are today, and then we'll jump into all the juicy numbers and strategies from there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, just right off the top, I uh, married with two kids. I got a 12 year old son and a nine year old daughter, uh, super, super duper fun ages and, uh, actually fun little, Side note is uh, a week from tomorrow when we're doing this interview, uh, we're actually heading out to Europe for seven weeks to go hang out in Europe together as a family, which should be a lot of fun. Come on. You can only do that if you have uh, financial freedom, right? That's what I'm talking about. Let's go. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. Should be, should be a really good time uh, with the family there. So uh, yeah. Anyway, so I, uh, I started, I guess my working life uh, in ministry. Actually, I was a youth pastor and a pastor uh, at a few different churches. I did that for like 14-ish years, maybe 15 years, uh, and uh, loved that and uh, had you know just a really good time doing that. But one of the things about doing ministry is it can be very uh, time and energy consuming. And so you know, when we started having our kids and our kids were real young. I mean, you know, yours are a little older than mine were when I took a break from ministry, but, uh, you know, when they're that young and they just require a lot of time, effort, energy from the parents. And, you know, when, when other people are need time from you also, it can, it can be very taxing, not just for me, but also for my wife who, is also trying to raise these kids and, and do all that. So time came where it was time to take a break from doing ministry vocationally. And so the question then became, okay, well, I have like 14 years of experience doing ministry and I don't want to do ministry anymore. What do I do? <laughs> and genuinely, it sent me into a little bit of a spiral because I didn't know. I, I didn't feel like I had any experience or you know, training or anything and anything else. Uh, and so, uh, felt really competent in ministry and really incompetent in everything else. So, uh, we were living here in Southern California, which is where we live now. Uh, we had a little house and, uh, trying to figure out what to do a little bit of money in the bank, but not, a, not a crazy amount. And so I had this genius idea and the genius idea was let's rent out our house here in Southern California. Our kids were like, one and three or one and four, something like that. Let's rent out our house here in Southern California. Let's go take the money we have in the bank and let's go buy a beach, a condo on the beach in Hawaii. Let's go live in Hawaii for a couple of years while our kids are still before school age. When they're school age, we can move back to California where we have family and know the schools and uh, rent out our condo in Hawaii and net gain condo in Hawaii, which I thought was a great idea. And my wife said, we could do that. Or we could buy a laundromat. And so I still don't own a condo in Hawaii. Ah, and I am man. still in the laundromat business. Uh, so that's <laughs> kind of the weird sort of path that we took to get into laundromats. Uh, you know, didn't grow up dreaming to be a laundromat owner, anything like that. Uh, but that's sort of how we ended up in the business. Nice. Well, well 
I love, I did not know that you were a pastor. That is pretty awesome. Actually, we just out here in the Boise, Idaho area where I live, our past or some of our friends, um, from our church, they started moving up here and then our church expanded up here, which is really cool. And the volunteer pastors that came up, um, they're very successful business, uh, business people and they do very well. So they don't need to take any money from the church, but they can dedicate their time because they too have financial freedom, um, to be able to do God's work. So pretty cool that you're there. Uh, awesome. you were doing that too. So, all right. So you, that is such a awesome beginning, but I like the, where you start, you said you were going to go to Hawaii and then she said, Hey, let's buy a laundry mat. Where did that come from in her mind? Like, I know that like most women aren't like, Hey, a laundry mat, let's go. Yeah. yeah. Unless they have to do the laundry, maybe. And even yeah, then they're not yeah. excited about it. Uh, Outside yeah. of the house. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, well, and it's even funnier because if you know my wife, which you don't obviously, but if you did, you would know like this is way out of character for her. Uh, she is very, she's a teacher and has that very like conservative, like get a job kind of mentality. And I had no entrepreneurial experience, no investing experience, nothing. Mm. Um, but you know, our main goal in taking a step away from ministry was to have more time, you know, to raise the kids, spend with the kids, you know, all that stuff. And so she, her parents had friends whose son uh, worked in Silicon Valley at a tech job or whatever. And he ended up quitting that tech job after he bought a laundromat. And, you know, basically story goes is he, you know, he just spent, you know, a few hours a week at this laundromat and it replaced his, you know, tech salary. And so my wife was like, well, that sounds great. Let's, let's do that. And so we tried to do that. It did not go that way for us, which I'm sure we'll get into here. Yep. Uh, but, uh, that was sort of the concept behind it. And it was, this was before I knew anything about real estate investing. I didn't know anything about business. And I, in fact, I learned about real estate investing while I remodeled the laundromat at night, uh, by myself listening to podcasts and, you know, ended up hearing about real estate investing for the first time after I bought a laundromat. So I, I was as green as they came and that will play out. Uh, in the story as we okay. go forward. So no laundromat experience. Your yeah. wife heard about the success of a you know her parents' friends and what they've done, and so she's like, "Hey, let's let's go down that path." Especially leaving ministry, no no income coming in at the time, correct? Or did she have uh, income from teaching? No. No, no, she wasn't teaching at the time. Oh, wow. So you yeah. guys really took a leap of faith, which was awesome. Just, hey, God will provide, right? Um, and so no laundromat experience. You, you heard her say that. You guys probably tossed around the idea. But from that point, what did you guys, like, how did you agree upon it? And then what was your first steps into identifying your first laundromat? Yeah. So, I mean, it Okay you know, just to be real, like I still really wanted to go to Hawaii and that was, that was the real, did you guys get into it? Uh, we, I mean, we didn't get into it, get into it, but I mean, come on, let's, let's be Hawaii, real. Hawaii, a laundry <laughs> yeah. man. Like I get there it. Were, there were many a nights that I was bitter about that later on. And you'll hear about that, but, okay. uh, so I mean, but I, I like the idea, right? The concept made a lot of sense to me, right? Like buy something that will produce income that's not dependent on my time. Like I, that, that idea, I still stand by today. Like it's a great concept. Um, and so, I mean, that's why I got on board. So, you know, the process looked like trying to do as much research as we could about the business, but there really wasn't a whole lot out there at the time. There wasn't a lot of information available and there weren't a lot of people willing to discuss the business. It was a very mm. closed Still is in some circles, but it's really opening up a lot now. But it was a very closed kind of community where, you know, it was sort of like best kept secret kind of thing where people didn't really want to talk about it because they didn't want a bunch of people coming into the business. Um, so uh, research was difficult. So that led to us just, you know, looking online for businesses and stuff. And we met some brokers that way. And then that's how we ended up finding our first uh, laundromat through a broker we met online. Got it. Was that local around you or at a distance? Yeah, it was, that was local. Uh, In Southern Paris. California? Yeah. Got it. So he's sending you these listings. 
you got them. And so tell us, how many did you go through before you picked the one that your first one? Uh, well, we probably went through, well, so pretty much the first one he sent, we're like, okay, this is awesome. Let's go take a look at it. And so we went and looked at it and, uh, I actually, I mean, it was like a big time fixer upper. We call that a zombie mat in our industry. And, uh, it was a big time fixer upper, but I was like, okay, I see the potential here. This is great. But the broker ended up talking us out of that one. Um, and I think there was, I think the, the seller was being a little bit unreasonable with what they were asking. And I, I don't really know the whole full story now that I'm thinking back about it in the context of what happened after this. Um, so who knows, but that's my, that's my guess. Um, so he actually showed us a few other places and eventually steered us to the one that we bought. Maybe we saw like half a dozen or so. So not too many. Got it. Not, a, and- not enough. Right. Yeah. And what, what were you looking for? Like, obviously if you're thinking, if we're talking and someone's like, wow, laundry mats, that's awesome. But what are you looking for when you're going to evaluate or buy a business like that? What was I looking for? Or what should I have been looking for? Let's go with what you were looking for and then what you should have been looking for. Yeah. I mean, really all I was looking for was something that I could afford that would bring in some money. Like Mm. that, that was that was all I was looking for. And I really had no idea to know how to know if a specific place would be bringing in money um, or not. And, you know, they're cash businesses and most of them, uh, especially at that time. Now there's more that are have digital payment systems, but still most of them are cash businesses. It'd be very difficult to verify income and, you know, all that stuff, which we can talk about. Uh, but, uh, you know, at the time I was just like, I, I, I basically relied almost a hundred percent on this broker to mm. tell me what a good deal is or not. And it, you know, that's, that should give you some good insight, you know, but I was, I was naive and I didn't really have anybody else to lean on anyway. So. Got it. Uh, so the yeah. broker gave you, said, this is the one you went and looked, you thought, what did you think at that point when you saw the, the one, this first one you bought? Uh, well, I'm, I'm definitely like a glass half full kind of person. So I was like, oh yeah, I see potential here. You know, there's apartments everywhere, which is usually what you're looking for. And, you know, there, it was, it was definitely a zombie mat. Also half the machines were out and half the lights were out and, uh, yeah, but I saw the potential there. My wife is, I wouldn't call her a half glass full, but she's a little more like, realistic, I think. Yeah. And so she saw lights out and machines out and where I was seeing new machines and shiny walls, she was seeing cockroaches and <laughs> broken machines and stuff. So, uh, I mean, yeah, you know, that's what it was, but, but for me, I was like, okay, <clears throat> you know, and, and the broker gave me a pro forma, right. And the pro forma basically said, Hey, look, here's how much money you'll be making. If you just come in here, put new machines in and renovate the place you know, it's going to be making, you know, five, six, $7,000 a month net, uh, after you pay all your expenses. And I was like, okay, well, I, I mean, that's more than I was hoping for. Let's do it. Yeah. You know? And so, uh, how much did you pay for it? So, uh, so we paid, we bought it cash, I think for 75,000, this is like nine years ago. So I'm giving you close numbers at least. Okay. Uh, so I think it was around 75,000 uh, that we paid for it, but then we put in mostly new equipment, which was another 150 at the time. So we we're in maybe like 225. Did you put cash in to buy everything or did you uh, finance that? Uh, so the equipment was hundred percent financed. It's one of the perks actually of laundromats is once you're in the business, a lot of opportunities open up for you, not just deals mm-hmm. coming your way, but also financing options and stuff like that. So hundred percent financing, or do you have to put anything down? hundred percent on the wow. equipment. So I bought the place cash, but hundred percent financing on the equipment. And what was the payments on that? What's the terms usually for something like that? Uh, so they've been changing since that nine years ago, especially lately. Uh, I, th- I mean, I think at the time I want to say it was like 5% interest for seven years. Ooh, um, what's it now? Then, uh, right now, the last time I checked, I actually have a, I'm interviewing a, a lender, a laundromat specific lender on my podcast, uh, next week. So I'll, I'll have the most updated, but last I looked, it was in the nine to 10% range. 
Um, and you can still get five or seven year uh, term on that. And you can also get like uh, interest only for a few months. Um, you know, some, some things like that to Art. kind of make it a little more palatable, especially as you're ramping up right. uh, business. Um, cool. That's important for everyone that's thinking about, wow, laundry mats. I never really thought about investing there. It's like, that's good information to have right now, you know, compared to what it was to where it is now, you, you can do your own little calculations to say, okay, this is how much if I had, if I bought it just like you, Jordan paid in cash, but I wanted to finance a hundred percent of the, you know, the equipment. And so, uh, do you remember what your monthly payment was in the beginning? Yeah, I want to say it was like seventeen or nineteen hundred, something like that. Got it. So nothing yeah. too crazy, nothing crazy, but yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't like, you couldn't drive Uber. Uber didn't exist then, did it? No, not no. Yet. So you couldn't drive Uber to pay it if you know you couldn't make any money. So, right. um, so you guys got the loan, you got the building, you close. Uh, did you own the real estate? No, this is in a shopping center, like a strip, okay. strip mall, grocery store. Yeah. And what was the? How much did you pay for rent? So rent, what, man, you're really putting me to the numbers here. I should have looked over that specific number. I want to say rent was, okay, so it was a triple net lease. Got uh, it. And just so everybody, I guess, is yeah, on the same page, triple net is the greatest invention ever for yeah. landlords and kind of a downer if you're a business owner. But triple net basically means the tenants of the property split all of the expenses of the actual property for the landlord. So the three nets of triple net are the property maintenance, the property taxes, and the property insurance. Yep. Um, so I want to say the rent amount was 2,700 ish. Um, and then every year is a 3% escalator. So it increases by 3% every year. Um, and then the triple net cost was like 1200 bucks a month. Mm. Um, so I was at close to 4,000, I think. Yeah. A month. I will tell you guys, if if you've been hearing triple net for the first time right now, um, Jordan explained it. But what I will say is if you're looking at those types of investments, you got to understand that's more mailbox money. So the returns are actually smaller than if you had like a short term rental, right? Um, or an office space, I guess you could say you're, you're paying for, you're lowering your risk. And so therefore there's got to be an exchange there. So you're not going to make as much, but like you said, as the business owner, the landlord of that building, they're making out good because you're paying for everything. And so yeah, we're not going to get into like deferred payment and well, but anyway, real quick on that is if you are thinking about going into that and a really good opportunity, especially if you're looking for like a retail strip space, something like that is if you find one that's not currently, that it's not currently rented out with triple net uh, leases, then actually, you know, putting a process in as leases come up, converting those to triple net actually can increase the value of your, uh, of your property and dramatically increase your equity in that property um, yes. over time as you do that. So as you convert those leases, so that is a, a potential really good opportunity, but buying yeah. one that is triple net already, like you said, the cap rates are going to be lower, lower. and your returns are going to be lower. So. Yeah. So good. That's a good point. Actually. You're right. I, I have a client of mine. Uh, he's in GoBundance too. Jordan's in GoBundance. I'm in GoBundance, but he, uh, my client actually, what he does is he finds strip malls that are not fully occupied to have great evaluations, um, negotiates and seller finance in great terms. And what he does is he, he fills them with businesses and they also do triple net in that. And so whenever he's ready to flip that, he's going to be making some good Good money. So, all right, we don't want to get off track because we're talking laundry mats. So, you got it. You're you you're probably in for like 40, 45 to five grand plus or minus in there that range a month. And so, you got the keys, you got the equipment. What you said that you were rehabbing. How long did rehab take? And I'm guessing you did it yourself because you didn't want to pay anyone. I, yeah, you know. Well, and real quick on the expenses. I mean, another big expense is utilities for laundromats, right? They're mm. heavy utility users. What's that wrong? Uh, so, I mean, okay. So the question to all, or the answer to all your questions is going to be, it depends, right? So, but at this specific laundromat, I think, uh, you know, water bill. So here in LA, right. Uh, water, we don't, we don't have water here. Uh, and so <laughs> we have, we literally have to import that stuff. Uh, so water's, you know, 
relatively small laundromat, wasn't doing a ton of business. So I think the the bill was like six, seven hundred dollars a month. Mm. Um, gas prices at the time, uh, we just had a big spike uh recently, but at the time gas prices were about five, six hundred, and electric was about five, six hundred a month for that small uh laundromat. So we're another fifteen to seventeen hundred dollars. So we're we're at like seven to eight thousand wow. dollars. Um, and then early on, I didn't have anybody cleaning it. I was coming every day and cleaning it. Uh, but there's another expense that came. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I love telling this story, yes. but it's also painful to tell it because it, you know, I just, I had no idea. I had no idea how to leverage people. I had no idea how to leverage money. I had, I, I didn't know how to run a real business. So it's all yeah. coming out. It's all coming. That's out. great. And yeah. I love that we're leading with this. Uh, I don't want to say mistake, but this learning lesson, because yeah. there's a lot of people out there. I know I coach a lot of people and they're just so gung ho and they just dive in and buy something. And it's like, whoa, 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 you know, do your homework, have an idea, at least a rough idea of what the numbers are going to be and what you need them to be and how can you improve it? So we'll talk a little bit more there, but um, okay. So you, you rehabbed, you cleaned. Um, tell, and so as we speed this part up, um, fill it, fill us in on kind of like when you got to the point of opening and how much were you doing on a monthly basis? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, one of the great things about buying an existing laundromat is, well, potentially is ideally you, if you, if you're not buying a, a complete overhaul fixer, ideally you're buying cash flow. And so day one, you get the keys, you should be cash flowing, um, which is awesome. I was not, however, uh, the, in fact, the broker, you know, normally there's a due diligence process and you go through and we can talk about what that process is, but, uh, the broker had told me, look, you're going to be putting new equipment in here. You really don't even need to do any due diligence. It's doing about 6,000 a month. And I was like, okay, that's pretty close to the expenses before the loan payment. So I should be able to get enough business in, uh, you know, to cover that expense to at least be breaking even early on. Right. Um, well, it turns out, you know, day one, first of all, my very first experience day one, you get the keys and you're like, Holy cow, what do I do now? Right. There's not, there's really like not a lot to do at a laundromat, like keep it clean, but you know, like yeah. what else do you do? So I'm like, okay. I'm like kind of walking around awkwardly waving to customers. Um, so I leave and I come back later that night to go shut it down. And the very first thing I see my very first day of owning a laundromat is there is a woman in there completely naked washing all of her clothes, uh, in the washer. And I was like, what did I get myself into? What am I doing? Like, so what awesome. is my life? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, that was my welcome party. It was, uh, yeah, it was, a. I opening one for sure. <laughs> um, it was doing though, less than $4,000 a month. Gross, gross. Right. So nowhere near that six. And I didn't do any due diligence. Cause he's like, don't worry about it. You're putting new equipment anyways. It doesn't matter, which, you know, big mistake on my part. Uh, but that's, that's what I did. Um, and so, um, put in new equipment. It took a couple, a few weeks to actually get the equipment and then have it installed it takes another few days or a week or whatever. So about a month or six weeks in put in new equipment and it, you know, the, the, the message in laundromats forever has basically been a field of dreams marketing plan, right? If you build it, they will come. Yeah. And, and they did come, right? I did. I put in new equipment and, and business almost doubled, uh, from what it was, but, uh, with, without any effort, but, you know, I was still sitting at around maybe $7,000 a month. Um, and expenses were at that time, like around nine, you know, thousand dollars a month. So I was losing, you know, I went from thinking, okay, Hey, look, I'm going to be making like four or $5,000 a month net to now I'm losing $2,000 a month. And and it lasted a really long time. And there are things I did. We can talk about. I prolonged that it should not have lasted probably like 18 months uh, should not have lasted that long. But, uh, but that was the reality of the situation, even though people did come, uh, it not, not nearly to the effect of what I needed. Um, right. and yeah. 
good cool well that's always fun when you have to put out two grand a month i i have an understanding of that um <laughs> but so what one minute what should someone have done during due diligence what should they be looking for that you didn't do yeah. So, I mean, number one, I always just recommend, Hey, you know, never rely solely on somebody whose paycheck depends on you buying the deal. Right. That was a big takeaway for me. Uh, and then number two, also make sure you have some runway capital. Uh, Cause we, we didn't mm -hmm. put all our money in there, but we put a big chunk of what we had into that, buying that business and, and getting it up and running. And so that 18 months was real tough uh, emotionally and all that. So, uh, and financially. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, you know, never rely solely on somebody whose paycheck depends on you buying a deal. Number two is I would say talk with somebody who uh, has experience, right? And now, you know, a big part of this whole story, which we can talk about later, but a big part of this whole story is because of all of these very expensive learning lessons, as you like to put it, uh, I had it, I, I ended up starting Laundromat Resource and just trying to put those lessons down for other people to learn them, you know, through a blog and then through a YouTube channel. And then I was like, well, if I really want to know how to do this, well, I need to talk to the best people in the business. So I started a podcast where I interview laundromat owners. Well, a lot of those people have shared their contact information on the podcast. And so find one that you resonate with, who's doing what you want to do and contact them and, and don't go through that process alone. I mean, I think that would have just saved me literally six figures easy uh, okay. of, of pain and money. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what about so an accountant that go through the books? Did someone be combing the books too and understanding that? Okay. So it's a little bit of a can of worms there that you're opening, but uh, maybe. Maybe. So laundromats tend to be accountants nightmares. I just got off a consulting call. I was telling the guy, he was an accountant, exactly this, like, Hey, look, just prep yourself. It might be a nightmare for you because laundromat owners are typically one of two things. They're either terrible at keeping books. Um, I've literally, uh, you know, I broker laundromats here too. I've literally had owners hand me profit and loss statements on a napkin, written on a napkin, literally. And you know, there, there's a whole lot of zeros on those numbers. A lot of times you can tell they're not real numbers. Don't know where they got them from. They're difficult to verify um, and all that. So they're either really bad at keeping the books or they're really, really good at keeping the books to the uh, point where maybe they even have more than one book. I don't know. You know what I mean? And so yeah. there's a lot of like skimming off the top and, you know, just, you know, paying under the table, stuff like that, that happens in any cash business really. Um, and so yeah, accountants tend to not like laundromats when they look at their books, if they even have books, because they rarely show that they're even making money. Some laundromat owners are doing a good job. And I think it behooves, you know, business owners in general, especially laundromat owners to actually keep good books, but we're slow to grasp that concept over here. So. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. So let's fast forward 18 months. You were losing money for, did you sell it or what happened? Where'd you go from there? I kept it. I probably should have stole, uh, sold it, uh, but I kept it. I actually just sold it recent, like a uh, less than a year ago. Uh, I sold that one. So I kept it like seven, eight years, something like that. Um, so tell us, did you, you, after 18 months, did you do something different to start making more money or marketing? Yeah. Different? yeah. So uh, so yeah, so, uh, you know, I was, I was kind of told you don't need to market in this business. And I realized one of the big lessons too, was it's a lot easier to retool and rehab a laundromat than it is to actually rehab the reputation of a laundromat. Mm, and that's I finally realized I needed to be more proactive about rehabbing the reputation of the laundromat and telling people that it's there and telling people that it's not infested with cockroaches anymore. And, you know, that kind of stuff, like, Hey, come check it out. Um, so I had to start doing some marketing kind of online and offline. Um, and, uh, yeah. And just kind of building relationships in the community, uh, myself, just whenever I was there meeting people and, you know, in the community and stuff. And, uh, yeah, so it, it was an effort to get there, but when I was losing money, I ended up kind of turtling up 
right? And I was like, well, I'm losing money. I can't spend more money to market or I can't spend more money to hire somebody to clean because I'm already losing money. So that's going to be more money going out. And I was already feeling the squeeze. And it was just this like death spiral that I was in for a really long time, which really prolonged that period. Yeah, man. Did you have a mindset coach at the time? No. Oh no. man, we man. Would have you know your what? If I did, right. <laughs> oh my gosh! Could you Shameless plug right there. Come I on. know. Gosh. No, but that that is a pattern, right? When you know it's yeah. fight or flight, and it's like or freeze, and sometimes people freeze, and no. if there's no one holding them accountable, say, hey, to proactively say, hey, what are we going to do about this? Versus, uh, let me just hope it goes away. And hope is not an effective strategy. And no. I see it time and time again for business owners. But so you started marketing. You started um, doing that. And how did that turn things around? Yeah, I mean, slowly over time. It wasn't like uh, you know, August I was I lost two thousand, and September I made a thousand. It wasn't yeah. like that. It was like I lost two thousand. I lost nineteen hundred. I lost eighteen fifty. I lost. You know what I mean? Like it was just this torturous. You know, and I just white knuckle gripped it. I just gritted it out and. Uh, and like you said, I, f- I froze, I was out of it. This is what happens though, when people jump into a business or even in real estate and they don't have someone that has the wisdom and knowledge. That's why coaching and mentorship is so valuable, right? And that's what you started a way to coach and mentor people so that they didn't make the same mistakes. It's actually folding time for people. And that's exactly what you're doing. So if you guys are interested in laundry match, check out his, uh, his channel and podcast and the resources that he has we'll put it on the screen here and in the show notes below but all right so you sold it like a year ago what was the most that you made in a month in that bit that first laundry mat uh like 3500 bucks okay like the most so it, it never it never reached the potential that i was hoping promised when i yeah. was by the broker you know you know yeah. the broker was like hey five to seven thousand is probably what you'd be netting and i never i never touched that so how much did you sell it for? Uh, well, I sold it to a buddy who is, I basically sold it for a little more than I bought it for. I, I want to say like 90,000 or something like that. Uh, did he and, have to take over the loan or where was everything paid off by that? No, I just paid off everything. And you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, I've found, and I've seen this a lot too, like as a business owner, as an investor, where you start, you, you don't, you don't stay there. Right. And so what, one of the things about laundromats that's so great about them is that, you know, if you buy a small laundromat or you buy a big laundromat, there's really no difference in the amount of effort it takes to run one or the other. So you can net three grand a month running, uh, you know, with a laundromat, or you can net 10 grand a month running a laundromat and you're really not putting forth much more Mm -hmm. effort, if any more effort. And so, you know, my, I always, I always say, Hey, look, when you're looking to buy a laundromat, you got two numbers. You got to keep in mind. You got your return on investment. What, what return on investment can you get? Which is, is really great with laundromats. It's a big perk of that. We can talk about that. Um, and then the other one is what's the threshold that makes it worth your while. If you get hundred percent return on your money, but I say, Hey, you're going to run a laundromat and you're going to make five grand in the year. Is it worth five grand for the year to run a whole business? maybe for your threshold, for my threshold, probably not. Right. And so that threshold can starts to move as you grow and evolve as a, as an owner and an investor. And so, you know, it's just time to kind of consolidate and, and start getting, you know, buying bigger deals. Yeah. So you sold it. Did you buy any before you sold that one? What happened after this first one, you kind of got it up and running and yeah, optimizing it. So about a year into owning this one, uh, a buddy of mine at the time who was a broker uh, was like, hey, I have another laundromat over (laughs) here for sale and it's a seller finance deal and it comes with the property. And I was like, okay. So I'm in the midst. I mean, this is a year in, so I'm not at that 18 month mark yet. I'm still losing money. And I'm like, okay, I'm intrigued. Uh, What do you got for me? So kind of shows me it's this lady she's retiring she's trying to get out of the business and she's owns a standalone building with the laundromat and she's gonna sell it here in LA for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars and I was like okay I'm interested 
and she was willing to finance 600,000 of it. If I could come up with 150 and I was like, okay. Uh, so I talked to my wife and my wife is like, wow, like we're losing money and you know, and I've been, I've been like spending my nights, like rehab in this place, cleaning up after homeless people who done, you know, God knows what in my laundromat while I was gone during the day. And, you know, and I'm thinking I could be on the beach in, in Hawaii right now. And, <laughs> and so we're talking about this second laundromat. And I'm like, look, this one, like we have learned the mistakes. Like we paid money to learn these mistakes. This one is going to, this one's going to do it. Like this one is going to cover the expenses we're losing over here for this first one and some, so let's, and we get the real estate for it. So we ended up doing that deal. Um, and we leveraged, uh, our, our house and got the down payment and bought that laundromat with that deal or with that real estate. And the way the numbers shook out, uh, where the way things got, um, where the, where the money was attributed was $550,000 for the property and $200,000 for the laundromat. And then she financed hundred thousand dollars on the laundromat and 500 of the 550 for the property, uh, there. Nice. And you said that this deal would pay for the expenses on the first one that you were losing. How did you know that? I, I said that. I said that. Ah, <laughs> How okay. Let's that? jump in. I, I did not know that. <laughs> well, so the number, uh, I mean, according to the numbers that I was given, right. And I was like, okay, look, but I know how to verify the numbers. Now I know that I have to do the due diligence. I know like all of this, these lessons that I learned, uh, you know, through going through the situation that I did, I learned and I'm like, we've learned all the lessons now. Keyword there that I said was all, and I didn't learn all of the lessons. So what happened with this deal is we, we, uh, we, we were like, okay, so we made our offer and she signed it. We went into due diligence. We started doing all the due diligence. Um, and she was going through like a divorce. So there was a holdup with like divorce paperwork and title for the property and stuff. It all needed to get squared away. So our escrow ended up being like four months long. And so we wow. did all of our due diligence kind of in that first like 30 days or so. And then on the back end, uh, what I didn't do and I didn't know to do, I didn't learn all the lessons. It turns out uh, what I didn't do and I didn't know to do at the end of escrow was there was a brand new laundromat that was larger that was built during the three months after we did our due diligence before we closed. And it basically opened almost the day we took over. And that's like the day I found out the day we took over is the day I found out about it. Oh. And so that was like an instant 40 ish, 35, 40% drop in revenue. Wow. Uh, day one right there. And talk about like a punch in the gut. You know what I mean? Like, how did your losing. wife take that? Not great. <laughs> I mean, dude, this is like our, this is like our dark period, you know, right. in our lives. And, you know, like the, the, the trauma that we felt, uh, is real, man. And it's still like, even to this day, like there's ripple effect, even though, even knowing like we came out of it. Okay. Like we're fine. Like we, we basically have had to start over two times now, like financially. Um, and so like, we've got basically wiped to zero twice now. And so did you do bankruptcy? No. Okay. No, we, we held on and, you know, so, uh, but you know, my wife did go back to work. I went, I went and like, I randomly was trying to figure out anything. I couldn't find any job. And I eventually got a marketing job for a casino and bar in LA. So I'm like, dude, my life is so weird. I was like a pastor for 14 years. Now I do marketing for a casino <laughs> and a bar and I own two laundromats, neither of which making money. And if you've ever heard anything about laundromats, the one thing everybody always says about laundromats is that there's a 95% success rate. And I'm like, how am I in the 5% two times, two times I'm in the 5% that's not being successful in this business. And yeah, it was like a punch in the gut and it was difficult financially, obviously the struggle was real, but also just 
my life became consumed with these laundromats and I would like come home and talk to my wife and she, it would just stress her out. And it got to a point where I was like, we couldn't talk about that stuff anymore, but my life was consumed about with that stuff. So we like, weren't communicating very much, like very well. And it was, it was rough, man. I'll just, you know, to yeah. be straight up, it was a rough, dark season time right there. Yeah. Yeah. We lean on God during those difficult times. Just give it yeah. to him, but <laughs> you know, you could pray on it, but you also have to do the work. Right. And so, right. um, so real quick, let's just talk, talk numbers as we pass through this deal. Mm -hmm. Um, and we could get to the good juicy stuff. So how much were you making or losing on a monthly basis on number two? Yeah. So I, it wasn't as bad uh, on number two, you know, the first couple months, you know, everybody goes and tries the new laundromat, they're running promotions and everything. And I didn't have any time to prep any counter promotions or anything. Cause I didn't know. Uh, so I was probably break even or losing maybe a grand a month, uh, there for a little while, which I mean, on top of the other two grand and really expecting to be making money on both of them and losing money on both or, or just not making money is, is still really tough. Um, and so, but you know, eventually I think customers trickled back cause ours was more convenient to wherever they lived or whatever the case may be. Um, and so, uh, so then, you know, it started making, uh, you know, a couple grand and then a few grand and, and then it kind of picked up from there like four or five grand. So it turned um, out to be a pretty good deal over time. It did. It just took a lot of effort and it was, it was, it was tough. I mean, it probably, it took over a year to get up to that point, but it was, uh, it was tough, man. It was a tough, yeah. uh, tough go of things there for a year. Or so, um, you know, and every little thing that happened was like, there's more money going out. Like somebody tagged the wall. I got to repaint it. I got to pay money for the paint. You know, it, just yeah. every little thing was like another dagger. Drop. So at the peak, what was the most you made in a month? Uh, uh, maybe at that one, maybe six or seven grand in a month. For that okay. Month. So that minus the two grand and then all your expenses, you guys were making roughly four to five grand a month. Yeah. Nice. Did you guys still have to keep your jobs at that point? So no. So I quit mine uh, for sure. I mean, I was making like $15 an hour. Ah, I like, gotcha. Yeah. Was, yeah. Like two so grand. My wife still teaches. She's, she's a special ed teacher and, you know, she still teaches. So, Very cool. uh, yeah. And our kids are school age now, so she doesn't want to sit around. Uh, but anyways, uh, yeah. So I, I quit that job and I did the laundromats full time. Uh, but here's the, here's the reason I felt confident about buying this laundromat, even after things got rough was, uh, I had all those podcasts I listened to for the first one. I learned a little bit about real estate and I learned how to value commercial real estate. Commercial real estate's based on the net income. And what I realized was if I draw up a lease between my two entities, my laundromat and my real estate, then the value of my, I, I can kind of dictate the value of my property based on how much that rent amount is right. Mm -hmm. So I can drop a triple net lease. So now my property has no expenses and look at, okay, well, what are top of the market rents for this type of space? And I, as long as the laundromat can support it and it's a reasonable rent, I can charge that rent. And basically I can increase the equity pretty dramatically in my property just by moving money from one business to my property. Um, and so I knew even if things didn't go the way that they should, that we would have that property to fall back on uh, as, as like a backup plan. Nice. So how much did you start charging for rent? For, so I think I started out at 3,500 plus uh, the triple net expenses, I think came out. I mean, insurance was kind of expensive, was like $500. So I think it was somewhere like, 900 to a thousand dollars for the triple net expenses there. Um, but basically that 3,500 bucks, and then it increased, you know, going forward, uh, you know, from there. And so that $3,500 is basically the net income. So, and you know, the cap rates in this is in LA proper, you know, it was like four or 5% cap rate. So you know, can you explain to so the viewers what a cap rate means? Yeah. So capitalization rate is, uh, 
essentially, if you bought the property all cash, you could expect to make that percentage. Um, so in order to determine the value, so if, let's just say you have a, just to make it easy, because my brain is simple. Let's say you have a 10 cap, uh, right? And you make uh, a net of $100,000 for the year. Well, you're going to divide 100,000 divided by 0.1 or 10%, 0.1. And that'll give you the value of the business. So what's that like a million bucks, right? Uh, for that. So, but if you're at a five cap instead of a 10 cap, you're going to divide that 100,000 divided by 0.05 or 5%, which is going to dr be dramatically higher uh, of a value for your laundromat than at a 10 cap. So the lower the capitalization rate, the quicker your uh, value of your property goes up. So those low numbers mean big changes for, for small net income changes. They mean big equity changes for, for your property. So good. Now, do you still own that business and building? Uh, yeah. Still do. Great. What's the, what would you, what, if you had to put it on the market today, based on how you're running it, what would the value of that building be now? Uh, so I bought it for five fifty. It'd probably be 1.3, 1.4, I think. Yeah. Man, 800,000, uh, in net worth increase right there, yeah, right somewhere there. around there, 800 roughly. Yeah. So, wow. Great stuff. And that business is still doing, what's it doing now? Like, do you know what last month's business for that second laundry mat? Uh, it's a little lower than normal, maybe like 5,000. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's it. I mean, with everyone listening, if you had a $5,000 a month passive income coming in, would that pay for your mortgage? Would that pay for your car? Would that pay for food? Would that pay for your utilities? That could be like your basic living expenses. If you're not trying to live like, the, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. And if you're not living in LA, like LA, you pay five grand for gas. So uh, no, I'm just messing. Yeah, <laughs> Go close, <laughs> close the way that state's being ran. Um, I love it. I love California, not because I like going there, um, but California, when we went through COVID, had so many people move to Idaho that yeah. I almost three my my property yeah. in my house went up like 300 percent almost yeah so um so yeah. anyway fun you're fact welcome. there you're welcome yeah yeah we do that texas. to a lot of people texas you know I mean, <laughs> you have texas everybody. too yeah. um all right so after you bought that second laundry mat yeah i mean we know you sold the first one last year you own this one in the building still um did you buy any more no so the uh so i I did start uh, with a couple buddies. We have a uh, an investment fund um, where we that we're just starting that we are planning on buying more, and I'll probably own through the investment fund going forward, um, or I'll buy larger laundromats that can afford to have a manager uh, help me manage the day to day stuff. Got it. Got it. Well, that's exciting. Now, how so? For everyone listening, he, two laundry mats, and obviously, depending on the business, just to build that second laundry mat could have bumped you up to almost a million dollars net worth. Yeah, just that one business. Now, look, here's what I love. You know, we're both in Go so You have to have a million dollar plus net worth to be in there. You gotta, um, you gotta be doing some things. Most people in there are in real estate, and so we'll talk about real estate here in a moment. But look. Net worth is awesome. It's just a number. It doesn't mean, uh, I don't, for me, I, I don't believe that it means anything like, whoa, you hear people like, what was it like Elon Musk? He lost like a billion dollars in net worth. It's like, okay, it's just yeah. numbers that are digitally going up and down and it doesn't mean much. Here's what you want. To, here's what you want. If you're listening to this YouTube channel, right? Master Life by Design, what you're looking for is exactly what Jordan and his wife have. And that's cash flow. You want passive income because here's what I will tell you. When you have passive income coming in that supersedes your bills, you can now have so much free time. You can go start a new business or buy a business and grow it. You have so many more options. You can go create wealth. What I love that you've done and I share with people all the time is business 
And um, Cody, quick plug and shout out to Cody Sanchez, who teaches people how to buy businesses uh, properly doing due diligence. Um, and then, but here's what I love about business. It can dramatically increase your income quickly. But what real estate does is it helps you build long-term generational wealth. And so I like to have a mix of both as the time goes on. And so um, Jordan, tell us... Obviously, you own the commercial building. Commercial is always a great way to, to play if you know what you're doing. But do you own any other real estate outside of commercial? Uh, yeah, I own just a couple of residential doors uh, in terms of real estate. Now, so, I mean, bear in mind, like within the last four, like we basically had to start over financially like four years ago-ish. Uh, and so, uh, so we you know, we had essentially nothing worth anything, uh, until then. So, and you're, you're dead on, like, I love what you just said about cash flow and, and the generational wealth. Right. And if your goal is that financial freedom, I mean, I, it's tough to be going the business route to get there as quickly as possible. Like if your goal is to get out of your nine to five as quickly as possible, like a laundromat, for example, your, your average return on your investment unleveraged without using a loan or anything like that is going to be 20 to 25% cash uh, on cash return. And wow. if you add a loan in there, that number actually can go up from there. Um, and so you can see how you can buy your financial freedom pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, coincidentally, as I was, you know, renovating this laundromat in the middle of the night, listening to real estate podcasts, like this is where I got introduced to the idea of financial freedom. And I was like, awesome. I just got to buy, you know, real estate properties uh, enough with enough cash flow to replace our expenses. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I started doing the math and I'm like, man, at like 150 to $200 a door, like how many houses do I need to buy? <laughs> like, how am I ever going to do that? And uh, so I love like the cash flow of real estate. But like you said, I think the real value in real estate is that long term generational wealth, that net worth side of things. And the cash flow, at least early on, is more of like an insurance policy, in my view, than the actual path to financial freedom. You can get there that way. I don't want to say that. Um, but it tends to be generally a little bit slower because you're getting, you know, six, eight, 10% return on your money versus something like a laundromat where you're getting 20 or 25 plus percent return on your money. So that cash flow compounds just so much faster. Uh, yeah. that way. So that's been our main focus is like, let's get cash flow and then turn that cash flow into, like you said, that generational wealth. You got it. You're, you're spot on there. And, um, and it, and as you were saying, when investing in it, like a single family home, a couple doors versus a business, right. has great returns, like a laundry mat. What we want to remember is everyone's different, right? There some people are very risk tolerant, right? And then there's some, a lot of people I know that are very security driven and, you know, just knowing those profiles, I, I've coached people like that. They want to invest, but if they're very conservative, they're not going to be taking those risks where, you know, like a short-term rental could, you know, could bring in a lot of money, but they're like, no, I want guaranteed money. So let me put a long-term rental in there and get $200 a month cash flow, mm -hmm. right? Which I would never invest for $200, you know, put up tens of thousands of dollars. Your cash on cash returns probably like 4% in some uh, cases. Yeah. You're like, no way. <laughs> um, versus a laundry mat, right? So get the freedom and business can be a great way to do that. But what most people, at least from coaching, you know, all these people over the years, they tend to go bigger. They'll go into multifamily, you know, start with a duplex or a fourplex and then move up to apartment complex. Ver and then they'll go into commercial buildings just like you did. So I love the fact that you kind of just, I know you were buying a laundromat, but you bought your first commercial building right out of the gate, which was awesome. Um, so uh, are your rentals in California or are they in other locations? California. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And how many doors did you say? Two. Sweet. Yeah. Two doors, had two businesses and a commercial building. And so real quick, as of today, four, I, this is going to make a big point here. What's your net total net worth currently? 
Uh, it's just north of 1.7. 1. 1.7 million. Yeah. net worth. Four years ago, you were roughly at a goose egg. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. How quick, everyone that's listening, look how quick Jordan and his wife turned things around for their family. And I know you weren't sitting there freezing. You were out there busting your butt and educating and, and doing what you had to do, where a lot of people aren't willing to do that. So really, my hat's off to you guys and that. And total cash flow, what are you guys bringing in on a monthly basis? I know it ranges with business and real estate, but just a ballpark. Like uh, from from the annual. rentals and laundromats or? Yep, in all passive income, annual. You know, what would you say your annual passive income roughly comes in around? Uh, I'd say if you take out my online business stuff, we're probably at seventy five hundred a month. Seventy five hundred a month. Eight, though. close to eight. Okay, yeah. so pushing six figures of passive income just off of the business and real estate, which and we didn't even get into the benefits of all that. With like you could depreciate oh, right yeah. your your buildings and your residential and uh, the for the in the laundromats. Yes. And, and the, gosh, the tax benefits have to be so amazing. Yeah. Here's what I will tell you. If for you guys that are listening, if you, if you work a nine to five, that's awesome. Go figure out a side hustle right away to start owning a business so you can start deducting. And there's a difference between deductions in tax time and depreciation. And so um, I don't want to go into too much depth. And I, I am not an accountant. I'm not a tax person. Do your own due diligence. You know, you can't hold me liable. I just have to say that. However, deductions, if you know it's ex an expense, you can take that off the total income you make and drop it down and you'll pay taxes on the remaining. The, uh, uh, when you have depreciation, which is great, and there's a cool thing called a cost segregation. We won't go into that. It's just basically accelerating your depreciation if you so choose. Um, but depreciation says, hey, you know what? If you're if you made a hundred grand this year, but your total depreciation was ten thousand, we're just going to deduct ten thousand. You'll owe on ninety thousand in taxes. But when you go to get a loan. The bank's going to say, oh, you depreciated $10,000. We'll give you a loan based on the 100000 that you made. And so it's so killer um, to reduce your taxes and still be able to continue and invest. And that's a secret that a lot of wealthy and successful people, especially in real estate, are doing. So if you want more of that, do your homework. And we'll talk more about it on the show. But just want to throw that out there for everyone. So... Awesome. All right, Jordan, before we wrap up, I got some good questions for you. Thank you for being so open, honest, and authentic. It's incredible where you were four years ago, and where you are today. I will say this, you, you guys were taking for 18 months, a $2,000 a month haircut, right? And so that's about $36,000 um, in those 18 months. But how many, how much do people pay in California to go to a state college for one year? right? Like 40, 50 grand to get an education that honestly, they're, most of them don't even get a job in that field. So um, I know is two to $3,000 a month, a lot to eat, but you know, in the bigger picture, it's like, wow, that was a cheap education uh, for the lifestyle that you have in just the last four years. So very cool. Um, all right. So a couple of things here. Number one, in your journey of the laundry mats, if you had someone that's starting out for the first time, what would you say is the number one thing they must pay attention to getting involved in laundry mats? Um, I mean, I think it's it's going to come down to due diligence. I mean, I think you need to be able to, uh, you know, figure out how much money is coming in, how much money is going out, and uh, and take a look at the trajectory of that business before and you ha and have a as clear a picture as possible uh, before you actually own that laundromat. Uh, and so that looks like, uh, you know, being cash businesses and stuff there, you end up having to stack various income verification methods in order to sort of narrow the potential income range down. Cause mm -hmm. no one thing is going to do that. Um, so, you know, you're stacking these things on top of each other um, and, you know, kind of alongside that, I mean, there's, you know, laundromat resource, we have lots of free resources for you over there and there's, you know, uh, a full in-depth course that you can buy over there too. But uh, there's, you know, easy, an easy way to go about this is just have somebody who knows the business go alongside yeah. you and look for red flags and, you know, look for things 
that, you know, you should be aware of and things that aren't meshing right uh, there. So, I mean, I think that that is kind of the number one thing is because if you get it in this business, because the returns are so good, all you need is a base hit. If you get one mm -hmm. base hit, sky's the limit for you because things will start to compound quickly. Uh, but as I have experienced, if you swing and miss on that first one or two laundromats, it can be a long, tough road to recovery. Yeah. No, I think you hit it the nail right on the head, right? Get coaching, get mentorship, go, go buy his course, go reach out to, to Jordan and his community and plug in. You have to have someone hold your hand the first time. I have a lot of clients that, you know, they're going into real estate. They don't feel comfortable with underwriting. And I, I challenge them to find two or three people that would help them teach them or verify their underwriting and show them where they can improve or what they've missed so that they can grow and get better and feel more confident because the goal of a mentor isn't supposed to be there every all year, all decade, all century to hold your hand. It's to teach you what you need to go or do, feel confident enough to go do it on your own and then do it to the level you guys are and sharing and teaching that. So very cool. What's one book that's changed your life or podcast? It could be either one. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, your this podcast obviously is uh, you know, that's a staple. It's gotta <laughs> be there for everybody, you know, just, and especially just for the, the mindset tips. I mean, and genuinely like the mindset stuff is, you know, this, it, I, it did not, it was not clear to me that mindset number one was even a thing. I never even thought about mm. that until semi recently and, and just how important it is. And in fact, to the point where I, I now sometimes get frustrated, like internally with, people, when I hear them say certain things that I'm like, I see the mindset that you have. And it's so different. It's, it's what I used to think. And now it's so different from what I think now it's so critical. So, uh, okay. So enough stroke in your ego, but, uh, thank but you. seriously, uh, you know, and thanks for, you know, unknowingly being my coach there for a little while. Uh, the one book, this is, this is partly a factor of, it's hard to narrow it down to one, but partly a factor of just, I've, I just finished reading it and then, and we had a GoBundance call with the author recently that was like mind blowing and I'm going through it with my GoPod right now. Uh, but the 10 X is easier than two X book mm -hmm. has been speaking of mindset has been a big mindset shift for me uh, in a lot of very practical ways. And it just hit me at the right time with where I'm at specifically on the online side of my business uh, over there. And as I'm trying to, you know, help more people through that platform, uh, it's been a, it's been a game changer, but I've been hearing that a lot, especially in the go abundance circle, uh, that that book is hitting a lot of people, uh, in great ways right now. Yeah. And the author got it, got to do a call for us for the go abundance mastermind, which by the way, if anyone's listening is interested in joining the go abundance, or if you're like, Oh, I don't qualify. We have a lower tier, just reach out to me so I can give you an affiliate link and uh, put in a good word for you. Make sure they accept you. So, um, awesome. I love that. And that is a good book. In fact, here's the deal. A lot of times people will read many books one time and I always heard and I live by read one good book many times and it'll change a lot of things for you. Um, last, uh, last kind of rapid fire question. What's one pearl of wisdom that has hit you over this last decade that you would love to pass along, or maybe you have passed along to your kids already? Oh, to my kids. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, honestly, uh, so, oh man, it's hard to narrow it down to one. I, I, I mean, I think, uh, one that just kind of sticks out and I'm, I'm talking to them a lot about it is, uh, you can't just be a consumer. You also need to be a contributor. And what that looks like in the context of my kids is, you know, they want to watch YouTube videos or they want to play video games or whatever, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with those things. Um, but I tell them, Hey, you can't just consume. You have to also contribute. And so a prerequisite for them to be able to do those things is that they have some platform that they're contributing on. And I don't even care what, and I don't even care if they keep changing what that platform is. So my son has had uh, a website where he shared uh, his artwork 
you know, as like a, an eight or nine year old, it was no nose color.com. I don't think it's still <laughs> up there anymore, but uh, you know, and he's had a YouTube channel and he's had some other things. My daughter has uh, a YouTube and she just crossed over. I think she's at like 120 subscribers now as a nine-year-old girl. And she's Come just on. like super excited making videos all the time. She makes all the videos herself. So but that's something that I've been telling them for a long time since they were little, little is you can't just consume. You also have to contribute. And, um, my, my thought process, my hope in that is that that will build habits and a mindset that will lead to, you know, success. Cause I do think that success follows contribution yeah. uh, most of the time. So, so good. So good. I love that. Um, yeah knowledge acquisition is important, uh, but knowledge application is a whole different story. And that's the difference between those that are successful or unsuccessful, a primary reason, right? Um, due diligence also helps in certain cases yeah, right. too, right? So and a little bit of um, grit sometimes. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And what I loved about your story is that you didn't give up, right? You didn't throw it in the, you know, the towel in the bag. You just said, you know what, let's double down, let's move forward, right? And it's, it's like you made this commitment that you're going to be successful. You're going to figure it out. And because I, I always hold this belief and I try to teach my kids this, there's always a way. There's always a way you can figure it out as long as you don't give up. And so many people, they fall three feet from gold, right? There's a book about it. Thinking Grow Rich talks about it, a story in there. And it's like they give up right before it. And it was, it's funny because, and I'm going to pull this up. Um, I sent, I was at the gym and trying to see oh there it is and i just clicked off i was at the gym and i sent my wife the verse of the day today and it says uh galatians 6 9 it says so let's not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up right and i just mm -hmm. i love that you know that scripture because i've gave up in things in my life i wish i didn't and i wonder what god had for me on the other side of that and my pastor here, he's always talking, he, again, I shared, he's a very successful business guy, but he always asks this question. He says, who's on the other side or who's going to be blessed because of your life working, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, we are, we're caught like, and I know I'm kind of going on my spiritual rant here, but like, we're called for our life to work for the glory of God. We're called to win in this world. He said, give us, we want to have dominion over the earth. He gave us dominion over the earth. Right. And here I am preaching to a pastor. Right. But it's like, we are called to win and take dominion over everything. And so you got to go out there, you got to succeed. But if you give up, it's really hard to do that. It's hard to start over. So um, anyway, there's my rant on, uh, the Lord almighty there. So all the was, honor yeah, and glory was, to him. It was great. <laughs> I'm feeling inspired right now. I feel like you should have had a pulpit right in front of you. And <laughs> I would, I would go to that sermon. <laughs> nice. Um, all right. So, um, before we let you run, I know it's been a, a good interview, a long interview, potentially. I know you said you had four hours, but um, where can rolling. people find you if they want to connect with you or your businesses? How, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, I mean, so laundromatresource.com is a great place to go. From there, you can find, uh, we have a free course that gives you an introduction on how to buy a laundromat. Uh, we've got uh, a full comprehensive course that gives you access to all the tools and resources you need when you're going through the process of buying a laundromat. It tells you step-by-step -step how to do it uh, that you can access there. Laundromat Resource Podcast is on all the podcasting platforms. We're on YouTube. Got a bunch of videos over there uh, to help. There's, uh, you know, the we have a, a pro community over at Laundromat Resource. It's just full of people who either own laundromats or you know, are, are trying to get into the business who are helping each other out, sharing wisdom, sharing advice, asking questions, all that stuff. So there's a lot of stuff going on over there. Uh, so laundromatresource.com and that should send you all the places you're looking to go. Beautiful. Well, we will have those. It's going to be on the screen here, as you probably already saw. You're, we're going to have it in the show notes. So check that out. Click on that. Make sure you subscribe to his podcast. But Jordan, thank you for being here today. Thanks for being open, honest with you know money and challenges and the heartache that you've been through. But obviously, as you didn't give up, you're living an incredible life with your wife and kids. So thank you for being on the show today. I appreciate it. It's a big honor to be on here. So I appreciate you having me on.
You got it. All right, guys. Well, if you're new to this channel, make sure you subscribe. Hit that notification button so you know when we have other shows like this the, of the Millionaire Series on different businesses and real estate investment strategies and the mindset from the videos that I do. And most importantly, comment below. If you have any questions for Jordan, comment below so that we can be able to pass those along to him and he can get back to you. And then most importantly, give it a thumbs up. And so with that, guys, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for being part of the Millionaire series and everyone have a great one. Go out, make today count. See you guys.